Well, thanks for having me here today. Um, as uh, Jacopo said, the topic of my talk today is on encrypting on computer encrypted data for fun and profit. And that's a collection of many joint works with a, a number of people from different institutions spanning all those university, the MDEA Software Institute, CISPA, Monash University, Protocol Labs, and um, ITU itself. This uh, work has also been uh, graciously funded by the DFF and by the Concordium Foundation. And the whole goal of what I'm going to present to you is to compute on data you cannot see in a way that it is still publicly verifiable towards other third parties that you have obtained the correct output. And in a way that this output can be used to perform financial transactions. So as a motivation, you might ask, why do you want to do computation on private data in a way that results in financial transactions and with public verifiability? Well, we have the problem of constructing secure cryptocurrency exchanges, which is a kind of service that is often hacked, resulting in the loss of billions of dollars. And one way of solving this problem, potentially, would be to decentralize the exchange in a way that there is no authority that holds the cryptocurrency spending keys during the exchange process. I guess that during the previous talk before, the, before lunch by Diego, you've learned about a little bit about how blockchain-based cryptocurrencies work. And you know that you need to have a secret key in order to spend a coin. And during the exchange process, the secret key gets sent to a exchange service, which might leak your key if they are compromised. So the point of this centralized exchange is to actually eliminate the single point of failure and allow a number of users interacting through a cryptographic protocol to perform this exchange without exposing their private data, their exchange parameters, or their uh, keys themselves. But then you might wonder, how could you actually implement such a decentralized exchange in a privacy-preserving manner? And apart from that, there's, of course, a number of other applications to everything from privacy-preserving machine learning on potentially sensitive data to privacy-preserving government processes, financial benchmarking, and financial applications in general. So usually we have a notion of computation where data is sent from a certain number of users to a trusted third party who computes on this data and then delivers the output obtained by, by this computation back to the users. This third party is trusted in the sense that if they do become compromised, the user inputs will leak, even though the party would not leak these inputs when they're honest. So they become a single point of failure. In the setting of cryptographic protocols, we are interested in removing this trusted third party and allowing the users themselves to perform computation on their private inputs without revealing these inputs to anyone, not to each other, not to a third party, not to any other person but themselves. The whole idea is that the input data never leaves the user's computers and, it is, and they actually exchange a number of encrypted messages in order to compute on this private data. In this setting, you have no trusted third parties and potentially private inputs. And you might get a number of guarantees about the robustness of this distributed computation, when it might fail or not, and exactly when data might leak and what kind of data leaks. In the setting that I'm exploring today, we are interested in a technique called secure multi-party computation. The classic example for utilizing this technique is the so-called millionaire's problem introduced by Andy Yao in 1981 or two. And in this problem, you essentially have two millionaires who want to know who is richest. However, they don't want to reveal the amount of money that they own. They don't, they don't want to reveal their wealth. They wish to keep this information private. So in order to determine which, who of them is 
the richest, they execute a cryptographic protocol that outputs a function indicating which wealth value X or Y is larger. So the function you're computing here is a comparison between X and Y, where, for example, you get an output one if X is larger than Y and an output zero if X is smaller than Y. And all that they learn at the end of this distributed computation is the output, but even though the inputs remain private, the inputs are never revealed to the external world or to the other millionaire that's executing a protocol. And these techniques are actually extensive, extensible to any function you might want to compute. You can have a setting with multiple parties, any number of parties you want, who each have a private input and where they jointly compute the output of a function on all of their inputs. You can imagine this as a trusted third party in the previous slide that was computing a certain algorithm on a number of inputs that were given by individual users. However, in this case, we have no trusted third party. So in order to perform this computation, the users will actually have to communicate among each other. They send a number of messages among each other until the protocol is finished and they can determine from the messages they exchanged the output of the computation while preserving the privacy of their inputs. This technique is actually also from the 80s and it has seen a lot of uh, work in recent times with a lot of uh, test cases and prototypes and demonstrations and so on. And it has the pros of being highly efficient these days and being secure, even in the case of dishonest majority, meaning that even if all of these users but one are corrupted, the one user who is not corrupted it still has the guarantee that their input will not leak towards the corrupted users. So we can achieve high security guarantees and efficiency, but we have no robustness. If one party is corrupted, one of the users is corrupted, they can already perform certain actions that will cause these protocols to fail. So they can perform a denial of service attack essentially without being detected. And moreover, when they obtain the output of the computation, they cannot prove to other parties that this output was indeed the one obtained by executing the protocol. Meaning that we cannot publicly verify that a multi-party computation protocol has yielded a certain output, which is a problem in a context where you must prove that certain computation was correctly performed. For example, when dealing with people's sensitive data or when doing a cryptocurrency exchange, as I said before. So we have this big gap in MPC research that existed to a few years ago. And a possible solution was proposed where you actually punish a party who causes a protocol to abort. And that's what we're going to be exploring. The idea of this solution is to use a cryptocurrency itself to punish a user who causes the MPC execution to abort. And as a bonus, we get the fact that the output of this privacy preserving computation can be used to determine distribution of financial assets. There were many initial results aiming at lowering the interaction with the public ledger, meaning the blockchain, and keeping compatibility with Bitcoin and so on, but most of them didn't achieve any practical um, efficiency. The best that was there before our work was the so-called BKM17 result, where you rely on a smart contract in order to eliminate the necessity for multiple rounds of interaction with the blockchain and the necessity to store too much data on the blockchain. So let us remind uh, ourselves of a few key concepts, starting with the concept of smart contracts, which is essentially a contract programmed in a 
programming language that executes itself based on a blockchain-based cryptocurrency, essentially performing financial transactions if a certain input condition is fulfilled. And most importantly, we can use smart contracts that take into consideration time in order to determine that a timeout has been reached for a decision to be performed or for an input to be provided. The exact thing that we're going to use here is a contract where users agree on the time before which they have to perform an action. And when they start the execution of the contract, they must provide a security deposit and then they must provide their inputs to the contract. The contract then essentially performs the computation that must be performed and using the output of the computation determines how the money that was initially deposited by the users should be distributed among the users. So we have an initial deposit, an initial set of inputs, and the contract determines based on these inputs how these deposits must be distributed back to the users. Notice, however, that these tools are all public. There's no private information here. And in fact, it is impossible to use a standard smart contract to keep private information because the whole point of a smart contract system is that a miner on the blockchain, the user producing blocks of a blockchain must be capable of executing this contract. And as we know, these miners, these users who get to produce a block are not known beforehand. So we would not be able to encrypt this information in such a way that only certain miners can obtain it and perform the computation. So the, all the information here must be public. And in the end, after the division of the financial assets is determined, the users receive the allocated amount of financial assets back. So this is a very powerful tool to encode business logics in a number of situations. And we will use it here as a judge of our privacy preserving computation execution in order to keep everyone honest in order, and also in order to allow our privacy preserving computation to determine how certain financial assets must be distributed. A very important point when trying to enforce that people behave correctly is having a timeout for the contract. If the users refuse to provide the inputs they must provide, or if they refuse to follow the protocol in the correct way, they will be subject to a punishment where the contract determines that a timeout has occurred or that some kind of malicious activity has occurred. And this contract removes the security deposits from the dishonest parties and redistributes the, these funds back only to the party who did act honestly. So in this case, this deposit acts exactly like a security deposit used for, for example, renting an apartment where you lose a deposit if you don't follow a certain set of rules. And this is what's going to allow us to use the contract in order to punish bad behavior in the execution of our privacy preserving computation protocol, our MPC protocol. What we will do here is, combine, is combining a MPC protocol executed directly between the users through private channels with a public ledger running a cryptocurrency and a smart contract system in such a way that the smart contract can determine if malicious activities were attempted by the users and punish the users that have been deemed to behave dishonestly. Otherwise, if the users behave honestly, we want this smart contract to distribute the funds that were first deposited at the contract according to the output of the privacy preserving computation. In this scenario, we first have all of the parties provide a security deposit. Then they execute the MPC protocol in order to obtain the output of the MPC protocol, along with a proof that 
a certain output has been obtained. When they provide their, their respective messages to the contract, the contract verifies whether they have provided valid messages and whether these messages determine in a specific output. Based on this output, the contract determines the distribution of funds and gives the funds back to the users. On the other hand, if we repeat this experiment, if we execute the system again, but one of the users refuses to send the messages that it should have sent, or if this user sends an invalid message, the smart contract will determine a distribution of the initial security deposits in a way that the cheating party, the one who misbehaved, receives no funds back as a refund. In this way, using financial punishments, we can incentivize users to actually perform computations correctly. And in the case where we actually outsource this computation to a number of companies that perform the privacy preserving computation on behalf of other users, we can use this mechanism to ensure that the companies both are punished in case they misbehave and suffer a reputation loss in case of misbehavior because the smart contract will forever store the, the information that a certain party in this privacy preserving computation has failed to act as expected. The challenges in instantiating this generic solution is that it turns out actually to be impossible to ensure that the adversary who is corrupting certain parties here, who is attacking them, cannot obtain the output before the parties can obtain this output, keeping the parties from obtaining the output, and then deciding to abort the protocol. However, it is possible to identify the attacker who has refused to complete an execution. And we can also identify that with public verifiability, meaning that we can prove to anyone that a certain party, a certain computer, has misbehaved in the execution of this protocol. The whole point of our work in this presentation is actually figuring out ways to make this cheater identification, aborted identification, efficient, at the same time that we introduce efficient methods for publicly proving that either a certain computation worked correctly, yielding a certain output, or that a certain party has cheated. In order to do that, we use certain building blocks from cryptographic protocols. The first of them, secret sharing, where you take some private information, you split it up in a number of chunks called shares that do not reveal any original secret about this private information, unless someone has enough of these chunks, if you have a large enough number of them above a certain threshold, then you can reconstruct the secret from the shares. And we also use something called commitment schemes, which essentially work as black boxes, as locked black boxes, where you can put a message, lock the box, and send it to a receiver while keeping the key. So in this procedure, which we call the commit phase, the receiver does not learn anything about the message inside the lockbox, inside the commitment. But later on, when the sender sends the key to the user so that it can open the commitment and learn the message, now the receiver also has the guarantee that the message that was inside this commitment has not been modified by the sender. Because, well, in our lockbox metaphor, the sender actually had this physical lockbox. So there is no way that this sender could have remotely modified the lockbox in possession of the receiver. So in a commitment scheme, you essentially send an encrypted message in such a way that it can allow the receiver to decrypt this message only at a later time when it, where it's convenient for you, while ensuring that 
guaranteeing to the user that you have not modified the message in the ciphertext. These tools are used in this um, proposed solution called BKM17 in the following way. We start with the security deposits towards the smart contract. Then you perform the MPC protocol, but instead of obtaining the output of the computation, you obtain secret shares of the computation, meaning that each party does not obtain the output, but instead they obtain a share that can be used to reconstruct the output in case all of the parties cooperate. Moreover, these shares are not given in the clear to the parties, they are inside commitments. And the parties have then to send their corresponding commitments to the smart contract, showing that they have efficiently, they have effectively completed the privacy preserving computation and are now ready to reconstruct the output from the shares and learn the output of this privacy preserving computation. In order to do that, they will later reveal the opening information to their commitments, essentially the keys that allow you to retrieve these shares, these messages inside the commitments. And the smart contract can use these shares to reconstruct the final output of the privacy preserving computation while being ensured that this output was exactly the one obtained by the protocol run that was run off chain by the users. And now based on this output, the smart contract determines how the security deposit funds must be distributed. However, if we have a dishonest user or an attacker who corrupts one of our users, this user can refuse to send the opening to its own commitment in such a way that it will learn the output because it sees the shares that were opened by the honest parties, but the honest parties do not learn the output because they don't learn the share from the corrupted party. But the fact that this user or this corrupted party did not send their opening to the commitment allows the smart contract to identify this user as a cheater, which would also be the case if this user had set an invalid opening to the commitment. Again, in this case that cheating has occurred and we cannot determine the output, the smart contract will identify who is responsible for the cheating and take away their security deposit, distributing that back to the honest parties as a way of refunding them for their work. So now we have a method that can potentially allow us to perform privacy preserving computation, computer on data we cannot see, in such a way that the output of this privacy preserving computation determines how certain financial transactions is done. And on the, on the case that an attacker compromised some of the parties involved in the computation, we can identify who, who was the compromised party or who was the attacker and financially punish them, making it not profitable to perform an attack against the system. However, the BKM17 solution had a number of flaws and left a number of open questions. Basically, asking what are the properties we need from a multi-party computation protocol, the protocol that performs the privacy preserving computation in order to instantiate this approach, in order to implement this approach without making the computation we have to do too complicated, too inefficient. Then how much can we relax these properties that we require from the privacy preserving computation in order to be able to construct them in a very cheap way that we could actually implement in practice. And uh, finally, how do we actually construct them in very efficient ways that can be implemented? We provide a partial answer to one by providing a characterization of some basic properties that are needed from the privacy preserving computation protocol in order for that to be combined with the smart contract in this approach for doing privacy preserving computation determining financial transactions and with financial punishments. First, we require the privacy preserving protocol, privacy preserving computation protocol 
to be universally composable, meaning that it remains secure even when it's executed in parallel with other protocols, which is the case of any protocol executed over the internet. Moreover, we require that this protocol is publicly verifiable, meaning that anyone can verify that a certain output was obtained from computing on this private inputs, even though they were not part of the original computation. And also we require public cheater identification, meaning that anyone can verify that a certain party has been cheating, has been acting dishonestly during an execution of the protocol. And then we construct it. We show a generic framework for efficiently constructing such privacy preserving computation with financial punishments and rewards by combining a number of techniques from the theory of cryptographic protocols with a standard non-private smart contract and uh, cryptocurrency scheme. In our results, we do not require any modification to the original privacy preserving computation protocol in such a way that, re that it remains as efficient as the best protocols we have for that now. And we make the footprint on the blockchain, the necessity of storing data minimal. We can perform such a computation while storing data equivalent to just a few transactions, a few cryptocurrency transactions, independently from the actual computation that's being done, which is very important since space on the blockchain is extremely expensive. We provide a full security proof mathematically showing that this is secure, even when executing in parallel with other um, protocols. We provide new constructions of oblivious transfer protocols, which are an essential component of this approach and of uh, homomorphic commitments. And we provide new constructions of uh, this oblivious transfer primitive also in a stronger security setting. And more recently, we also showed that we can make our whole approach even more efficient and eliminate the need for so-called homomorphic commitments, which I will explain in a bit. The tools that we're going to use in our specific approach are essentially this, so this technique we call pre-processed multi-party circuits where you can run some computation independent from your actual input in your later computation. While your processor is idle, while you have low system activity, you can pre-compute a circuit that will later help you compute the actual computation you want to compute with your actual inputs in a way that you obtain the outputs. And this has the nice property that you don't really obtain the output of the computation, but rather shares of this output, which is a fact we're going to be using later. And then you reconstruct your output from the shares. This has another very interesting property that after you do this pre-computation, the actual privacy preserving computation you run on your actual data or client data happens extremely fast without the overhead of many of the heavy tools that we have to use in order to do the pre-computation. We also use so-called homomorphic commitments, which means that when we have messages inside those locked boxes, we can compute on them. We can compute on these encrypted messages in such a way that, for example, we can add two of them, a first and second message, in order to obtain a commitment to the result of that addition. And then later on, we can provide opening information in such a way that you recover only the result of adding these previous uh, messages and previous commitments without recovering the original messages that were added to begin with. This is also another important tool in our construction, even though very recently we've shown that we can even do without that. We can do what we do with a simple commitment scheme without the homomorphism. Now, in our framework, we will start by executing an MPC protocol uh, based on the BMR technique, where we obtain shares of the 
circuits that will be executed. We give them to the smart contract, just commitments to them along with our security, uh, security deposits. So these commitments we're posting here can be made as small as a cryptocurrency transaction. Then we run our MPC protocol, obtaining commitments to the outputs. And then we also send those to the smart contract in such a way that we also use a tiny, tiny space. We compute some sort of local output that we later also review to the smart, to the smart contract, allowing the smart contract to determine the output of the computation and to determine how these financial assets should be distributed among us based on our private data, even though they don't know, nobody knows our private data, our private data never left our computers. In case someone cheats here, again, we would have a very easy way to identify them as cheaters because we would see that they did not provide their opening information or that they provided invalid information. And then we could take away their security deposit, making it not profitable to, to, to abort an execution. Now, in the first incarnation of this work, we have this very complex construction of the homomorphic commitments that we needed in this approach, involving many building blocks and um, a very high uh, performance overhead. Luckily, in the past couple of years, we actually managed to simplify this homomorphic commitments quite a lot, now being able to construct them directly just from a simple commitment with no homomorphism or just from a hash function. This is what we call uh, as a global random oracle. This is essentially a hash function. So we, sh we show, then we, last year we showed a way to perform this um, kind of computation using only a hash function for the homomorphic commitment, which makes it much more efficient. And then this year we actually showed that you do not need any homomorphic properties. You can just, you can do this privacy preserving computation with public verifiability and, um, and punishment, just departing from the DMR technique, which requires simple assumptions that we use in our day-to-day -day, plus a hash function making our approach even more efficient than it was before. And in fact, we have implemented this uh, scheme and uh, it shows that it can execute sizable computations in reasonable amounts of time. We have implemented more specifically the example case of a cryptocurrency exchange where no one ever learns the keys needed to spend the coins in such a way that there's no, no option for uh, an attacker or a hacker to hack into an exchange and steal funds. That attacker would have to individually hack into every party involved in the computation, which is a much harder task. And in which case it could just steal the keys directly from those parties. It wouldn't need to, um, it, it wouldn't have this one single point of failure from where it could steal all of the funds. Some of the insights from this work is that we can use MPC schemes at have this public verification and verifiably secret shared output in order to compute on private data in such a way that we can publicly show that someone has cheated or that a given output was obtained. And apart from more technical um, insights from the theory of cryptography, and we also have shown that our modular approach can be used for compiling specific purpose protocols that do specific computations into privacy preserving smart contracts essentially. Now, what this gives us is a way of constructing a smart contract where the data is no longer public. Now the smart contract can be executed over private data by means of a privacy preserving multi-party computation scheme. This means that you can actually use smart contracts that self-execute on top of a blockchain with a cryptocurrency to conduct proper business where 
inputs to contracts are private and where they cannot be revealed due to a number of business concerns and regulation concerns. As you are probably very well aware of, the GDPR, for example, does not allow us to review customer data publicly anywhere. So how, how would we actually use a smart contract to conduct business on a public blockchain? We need a way to do that with private data. And this is exactly what this flavor of multi-party computation with financial transactions and public verifiability gives you. One application would be, as I had mentioned before, decentralized exchanges, but this extends to any application that could benefit from computing on private data. For example, uh, another up and coming example with the whole corona pandemic is the analysis of sensitive personal medical data in order to determine infection trends and rates and to research cures and treatments. Usually when uh, hospitals and doctors collaborate in this kind of effort, they face a lot of barriers in obtaining the clinical data from patients in order to conduct their research, exactly because there's a number of regulations protecting the way that this data can be used and shared. However, with such an approach, we could actually make encrypted versions of, of this data available in such a way that can, they could be computed on by researchers who need this data to find a better treatment, a better cure, or a new information on the infection trend. And because of the public verifiability properties, we can then prove that the, the output that the researchers claim they have obtained was actually obtained from the real data by doing correct computation. So it's a, an, a, yet another good way to debunk the crackpots who could say that the outputs are being faked. Here you can publicly prove that there has been no malfeasance of faking. And then the financial incentive, for example, would serve, could serve as an incentive for users to voluntarily provide their data in exchange for a small payment, for example. So this idea of computing on private data can be used in a number of applications where we would like no single point of failure that could be exploited by an attacker to obtain this private sensitive data. And when you combine it with public verifiability and financial transactions, you can both incentivize users to provide their data prove to the users and to regulatory agencies and to other third parties that the computation is being done correctly, and then reward people financially for um, participating in the computation. Some future perspectives on this line of work are first figuring out a generic way of making cryptographic protocols publicly verifiable without interaction between parties, meaning that you want to prove that a certain output has been obtained. And we actually did that recently. Um, and then other future perspectives are more technical. An interesting one I can mention is doing this kind of privacy preserving computation on so-called uh, with so-called micropayment or state channels which allow you to perform cryptocurrency transactions without actually touching the blockchain in order to increase efficiency and speed while decreasing cost. Another interesting uh, goal is providing specific purpose protocols for decentralized cryptocurrency exchanges, even though our recent results implementing these approaches have shown that our general purpose approach can, all, can actually be deployed in the context of cryptocurrency exchanges with satisfactory efficiency. Finally, because we can punish parties who misbehave, it is of course interesting to survey from an economical theory point of view and a game theory point of view, how to set up economical incentive mechanisms that will indeed incentivize parties not to cheat and to remain honest. Towards that, there's also some recent work we have done where we can uh, prevent an attacker or hacker from learning what the output will be before they decide to make the protocol fail or not. So they have to make this decision in, in the blind and it's equivalent to basically guessing. They might be making a protocol abort 
in a situation where the output would actually benefit them more than paying the fine for Borden. Well, that was it for uh, this presentation. And I'll be happy to take your questions either here or in Gather Town or offline via email. Thank you, Bernardo, for uh, your uh, presentation. I think it's uh, question time, so feel free to use the chat to ask your questions. There is already one uh, here. Um, sounds like MPC with punishable abort incentivize uh, the DDoS attacks against other parties. No? Can you just elaborate a bit on that? That's an interesting discussion because, of course, if you are able to mount a DOS attack against a party to make that party fail or seem to fail to perform the steps it should perform in a protocol execution, then yes, you would cause that party to lose their security deposit. And if you're one of the other participants in this computation, you would be refunded for your work with part of that party's security deposit. So that could be a way of actually exploiting such a system for your own profit. However, the problem of providing resiliency against DDoS attacks is rather an orthogonal problem from the problem of constructing privacy preserving computation. While it would be important to distinguish in this case between an actual malicious party refusing to participate and a party suffering a DDoS attack, this is not really the focus of our work. This is rather a orthogonal um, issue that we could actually use some cryptographic tools to solve. For example, you could do all of this computation in an anonymous way where the parties don't know their identities, meaning in practice that they don't actually know their IP addresses. So they could perform this MPC computation using other cryptographic tools to exchange messages without actually knowing each other's addresses. In that setting, you wouldn't be able to DDoS them because you wouldn't know how to reach them. However, that would of course have a performance overhead. And I believe other network security based measures against the DOS attacks might be a better option to counteract this kind of malicious utilization of this infrastructure. However, it is indeed a concern that a, that a party might be DDoS on purpose to make them fail during such a computation. Thank you for uh, the, the answer. If uh, there are no other questions, I have uh, one. So you talk about uh, before about uh, pre-computing uh, things that later on uh, you, can, uh, you can use. And I, can you, in a way, give us a bit more uh, details on uh, the amount of pre-computation, so the nature and if it's, how much is the overhead there? And uh, also in connection with uh, like uh, this uh, big movement these days, uh, uh, going green and uh, while well, caring about uh, the environment, is it like to such a stand that can actually uh, consume a lot of uh, computational power to, to do this pre-computation or is something negligible? Well, when we do privacy preserving computation, we always have an overhead versus just computing on the clear tax data. If you want to compute on this sort of encrypted data, you of course need to do more operations in order to get to the same result than you would do if you actually could see the data. That costs computation, which costs time and energy and space and so on. However, using pre-processing, what we can do is move the bulk of the necessary computation to what we call a offline phase that can be done at any time or a pre-processing phase. What happens there is that we do the majority of the computation that we want to do before we actually know the inputs we want to compute on, before we actually perform the computation we want to perform. So our pre-computation is a preparation to process the data that we will process later that will take most of the time that it takes to do this privacy preserving computation, but with the advantage that it might happen at any point before the actual inputs are known, which means that you can use idle time from your systems to perform the pre-computation. 
instead of having to sit and wait while a long, complicated privacy preserving computation is performed. You use your system idle time at night or at whatever time that you don't have that much load, instead of having to add more resources and consume more resources in order to do this computation. And after you do the pre-computation at the so-called online phase, when you actually learn the inputs you will compute on, the necessary steps to finish the privacy preserving computation are very, very little and you can execute the actual computation on the inputs in a much, much faster way. Of course, it's still with an overhead in relation to computing on the, on the clear text data, but with a reasonable overhead of taking, let's say in, in the case of the cryptocurrency exchange, taking a few seconds to compute the exchange operations instead of a few milliseconds, but still a few seconds is a reasonable amount of time to wait for an exchange operation. So that's how uh, pre-processing affects both the efficiency of the final protocol and the way that you consume energetic resources. It allows you to move most of your resource consumption to idle times, idle system execution times. Then great, thanks. Uh, uh, there are no further questions from uh, the public, but I still have uh, one uh, concerning a bit uh, the scalability, uh, especially so are this method uh, very scalable in terms of the number of participants and uh, especially for the applications that you had in mind to, to what is the, the maximal number of, uh, for instance, uh, uh, parties that uh, you think could be involved in uh, your uh, protocols? So the protocol actually performing the computation with the inputs that are provided by each party only supports with reasonable efficiency, a limited amount of parties, something in the order of tens of parties or even less. However, the way that we solve that is by outsourcing the computation from a large amount of users, hundreds or thousands or even more, to a small group of servers that then computes on their inputs. Notice that this does not mean giving your input to the server and trusting the server to be honest and not attacked. The way that this is done is by secret sharing the input among all of the servers from each user to all of the servers in such a way that a user input would only be compromised if all of the servers are compromised at once, which eliminates the single point of failure. It is still not as uh, resilient as having the user, the users themselves run a computation because in that case, the input would never leave their, their own system. It would only be compromised if their own system was compromised. However, you can outsource the computation, the privacy preserving computation in such a way that the, a small group of servers can service a very large number of users in an efficient way and in such a way that user data can only leak if all of the servers are compromised, which is obviously a much harder task than compromising one single server, especially if you're following uh, best practices and hosting the servers in different platforms, different places, so on and so forth. Perfect. Thanks uh, for, for the answers. This uh, clarifies it a lot.